Hello friends, this is Ryan from Behind Eyes Gaming, and welcome to another Path of Exile video. Today I'll be going over the basics of gearing your character. Some of the most common questions I get on my channel are related to dying too much or not having enough damage at certain points in the game, or in the early end game. I'll be going over what kind of gear you should be looking for as you level through the game and into the end game so that you can start farming end game maps comfortably in order to prepare for the end game challenges of Path of Exile. I'll be talking about gearing while leveling first, and then I'll move on to gearing in the early endgame. I'll provide timestamps in the description below to more easily navigate the area that you're interested in. Starting off the game in Act 1, gearing is quite simple. You'll mostly just need to be looking for movement speed on your boots. Some life on gear is nice, and it can be easily gotten with coral rings. Make sure you keep your weapon upgraded with some extra physical damage if you can find it. If you're playing a spellcaster, use your highest base wand or scepter, and try to find some spell damage or elemental damage added to spells for a bit of a boost. You may also want to use a sapphire ring or two for the act boss Merveil if you're not familiar with the fight. In Acts 2 through 5, your gearing priorities start to ramp up a little bit. If you're using an attack, then your damage is going to start falling off possibly because you're unable to find a suitable weapon. You can actually use the physical damage vendor recipe to get a nice weapon. I've done a video including this recipe in the past and I'll provide a link in the description below for those unfamiliar with the recipe. In Act 3, starting at zone level 25, four link items will start dropping and will appear in vendors of Act 3 or later if your character level is at least 25. Adding more support links to your skills will drastically increase the power no matter what build you're playing, so I would recommend focusing on that. You also start getting two stone rings, which provide a fair amount of resistance, which will eventually become very important. I would generally watch out for jewelry on the ground to identify, as their implicits combined with other useful stats will give you a big boost early on. At the end of Act 3, you can do the library quest to gain access to all skill gems available at that level, and then midway through Act 4, you'll gain access to the rest through a quest. At this point, it's good to set up the gem link setups you'll be using for the rest of the leveling process. Hopefully by then you've found enough 4 links to set up good movement skill, damage skill, and any support link setups you might need. At the end of Act 5, you'll face Kitaba. He's the first major gear check for those unfamiliar with the fight. His attack patterns are very predictable, and once you become good at the fight, your gearing needs for him will be much less. But now, if you are having trouble with him, I'd suggest trying to make sure you have at least a higher life and fire resist. A granite flask at this point can also be very helpful in mitigating many of his attacks, as he does a lot of physical damage with several of its attacks. After defeating Kitaba, you'll lose resistances permanently. This is going to factor into your gearing significantly as it'll force you to focus much more on resistances than you have previously. In Act 6, I would recommend having over 50 fire and cold resistance at least. If you need to, you should start using the crafting bench in your hideout to get your resistances in line. The fire cannibals in the early part of the act do substantial fire damage, as does the act's first mini-boss in the form of a fire beam totem. The end of act boss does a ton of cold damage, as do the monsters in the zone prior to him. You should also continue to improve the life on your gear and attempt to get higher movement speed on your boots if that's possible. Act 8 has the next major gear check in Dwedre, the earliest mini-act boss. She's both very punishing to characters that don't have enough damage or survivability, as she has curses that stack up the longer the fight goes. You can reset them to another curse by pulling the lever or spinning the wheel, I guess, to buy yourself some time, but it can still be very punishing. Spellcasters will generally be fine as their spells will scale with the gem level and links, but attacking characters might have a bit more of a problem if they don't have suitable weapons. If you happen to have a rare weapon that's close to your level and has either percent physical damage or flat physical damage, you may want to consider crafting the other one on the crafting bench to substantially increase the damage. The first zone in Act 9 will be Blood Aqueduct. This is a perfect area for farming gear if you're feeling a little weak. 
If at any point prior to beating the story you feel weak, I would recommend coming back here to farm this zone for gear, as the drops of the items are strong enough to beat the game usually, along with some divination cards for a tabula rasa which can provide you a 6 link for any build, drastically increasing your damage. You can reset the zone to farm it by control clicking the zone entrance or the uh, waypoint menu for the zone to start a new instance. At the end of Act 10, you'll face Kitaba again. It has the same mechanics more or less, but if you learned the patterns, it can be a pretty easy fight. Otherwise, if you're having trouble with the fight mechanics, uh, it'll be a bit of a gear check again. I would recommend 3.5k to 4k life for this fight, generally speaking, along with 75% fire resistance. Upon defeating Kitaba, your resistances will drop permanently yet again, and the real endgame gearing begins. For maps, you'll need 75% of every elemental resistance. Endgame is balanced around having maxed resistances, so you'll be taking fatal damage if you have substantially lower than that 75% resist. For instance, if you have 40% resists, you'll actually be taking basically double damage from spells and attacks of that element. I would also recommend having an effective health pool of over 4000 to start with if you can, with plans on improving it. I haven't taken into account energy shield or things like mind over matter, but you can consider them part of your effective health pool to a certain extent. That being said, something like 2500 health and 1500 energy shield might still not work that well if you don't have some chaos resists as well against certain enemies, as the chaos damage will bypass the energy shield. You'll also want to have another defensive mechanic working for you. This may be high evasion and dodge, or substantial physical mitigation from armor and fortify. Usually in the endgame, stacking defensive measures will help you survive. You'll probably want a cast on damage taken setup as well. I've put out a video on utility gem setups, and we'll provide a link to that in the description below if you want to check that out. It can be very helpful in the endgame. In terms of damage for attackers, you'll generally want percent physical damage and flat physical damage unless your build scales elemental damage, in which case I would find a guide on how to scale that properly. If you're going crit, you'll want to make sure that your base crit on your weapon is somewhat high unless you're playing a slayer which gets some natural crit chance. Critical strike chance is used as a base for the percentage critical strike chance you get on the tree and other gear and will scale up more quickly with a high base crit. Attack speed is also important and optimally you'll have all of these stats on a weapon usually in that order of importance. If you're having trouble finding or crafting a good weapon and are on a trade league, simply trade for a decent endgame unique weapon in your category. Usually you can find a decent starting endgame weapon for one chaos orb or even cheaper. For casters, you'll want a wand or scepter with spell damage, cast speed, added elemental damage to spells in that order. You can also get spell crit or crit multiplier if you're going crit. I would recommend prioritizing them in that order and getting as many of those stats as you can. It'll drastically increase your damage. All classes should generally strive to get at least 25% movement speed on boots if possible. There is a movement speed crafting recipe in the epilogue in the town. It's in the upper corner of the town as well if you're having boots with great stats and an open prefix that you can craft movement speed on. So simply grab that and craft it if needed. With the proper defensive stats and a decent weapon, any competent build should easily be able to do at least the earlier maps. Just keep adding survivability in the form of more effective life to your build as you level and get new gear and continue to try to upgrade your weapons and build in order to progress from there. You can also find a build guide for your class to see what works well in the later stages of maps. I hope you found this guide helpful. I will occasionally do more general new player guides and have done so in the past, so check out the videos on my channel if you need more help, and subscribe to see more in the future. This has been Ryan from Behind Eyes Gaming, and I will see you next time. Bye!